particular organization's case and share with us what do you think with respect to OTTs and net neutrality. So let me first start with um, Maria Cristina. You would like to start first at Google? Sure. Put me on the spot right now. Yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I really wish I could be there with you. It's much better weather than what I have here in Mexico City, which is where I'm based. Um, but alas, hopefully next time. And um, I think I'll just start by, by saying, Dr. King, that was a, a, that was a great presentation and a, and a very useful uh, way of visualizing, you know, the, the problem that, uh, or, or the issues that we have at hand. Um, as you say, this whole definition uh, of OTTs uh, has been changing over the years and, and, um, and now is sort of at the center of our discussion. I do want to highlight some things. So I think that the, that the first thing that we shouldn't lose sight of is that we do have a mandate and I think um, a joint public, private, uh, technical community, uh, civil society organizations in promoting the development of the internet ecosystem, if not for other reasons that um, through the internet as a platform, we are seeing more and more and more opportunities for exercising our human rights, our rights to freedom of speech and access to information, for example, but also to finding new business opportunities to jumpstart um, our access to the global market. So any, any company now or any individual now uh, with an internet connection and a business idea um, can become a micro multinational overnight uh, by using the internet. So that's what's so powerful about this, uh, about this platform. And I think that um, content developers, platforms like Google, uh, apps that are on your mobile phones, uh, they have flourished over the years because uh, of the internet's low barriers to entry. Uh, so if we talk about competition, uh, low barriers to entry are an ideal, uh, right? So anything that, um, that ups these barriers should be carefully considered as to their effects later on. Um, and because in the world we are at different speeds in getting online and in really taking advantage of these technologies, I think uh, in countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, as we think of how we can up the access and make sure everybody um, actually gets to, to be online, um, we need to be thinking, how do we make that potential be uh, a realization of business opportunities, of exercising our rights, of really becoming you know, this, this uh, force for, for development? Um, and I think that I, I, this principle by which the internet was born, which is uh, permissionless innovation, right? Innovation without asking for permission um, should still be the guiding force behind how we think of any regulation coming forward. Um, I think uh, that Dr. King put it well in, 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 how we add value to each other, the telecom providers and the content providers or the services that, that um, happen or that we use over the internet. Um, we do work closely with telecom providers from Google, but also Facebook and any other app, I mean, that, that you use over online. We invest heavily in um, data centers and content distribution networks in leasing capacity to move content across the internet. Um, I think that because, so it, it's kind of looking at this in infrastructure investment from different angles and understanding that each of us actors have a, a part to play. But the reason that um, a Google, a Facebook, um, an Akamai, any, any one of us it would invest in infrastructure is because users in the end are demanding content any point at any time, anywhere they are right now, uh, and increasingly over their phones and increasingly over wireless networks. So um, they have an interest in getting access to the content and using it. We have an interest in getting it to them. Um, the telecom providers have invested heavily in the infrastructure, in the basic you know, fixed or wireless infrastructure. We have an interest in investing too. We are complementary to one another. Um, 
and, and we add value to each other's services. That doesn't mean that we don't compete or that we don't start competing in some of these, um, in some of these services. And I think that's the healthy part of this, that uh, at this point, nothing is written in stone, right? Um, all of us are heavily competing to provide a service that the users are demanding. And I think anytime you talk about competition and about um, access, um, the focus is in the end with the users and what's useful for them. Um, I think the Caribbean has an opportunity to still establish a balanced and cutting edge internet um, regulatory framework, right? An ecosystem um, because not everything is written yet. And that, that can go from anything from data protection to cybersecurity uh, to net neutrality, which is the other topic that you're mentioning today. Um, of course, I mean, if, if I'm going to speak from Google, we support an open internet. Um, we really believe that competition and innovation are the best ways to get faster networks and to uh, discipline the behaviors uh, that can either harm consumers or help them. And, um, and I think that both Europe and the US, and as you are looking at this, have decided that because we want to let the market innovate on this principle of permissionless innovation and make sure that we're still allowing for the small creators to become large, because I think that's still... Maria, Maria. I'm going to cut in one second. Okay. Uh, then we just, you know, looking at a case-by-case -case basis uh, can also be a guiding principle. That's it for me. Thank you, Shernan, and thank you, everyone. Yes. yes. Sorry for interrupt you, but you will, we will be giving you the opportunity, let's say, to give some recommendations later on as well. So I just want to hear just your opinion, very um, high level with respect to what um, Dr. King said, okay? <laughs> okay, um, let's proceed with, um, thank you very much. Uh, muchas gracias, Maria. Let's proceed with um, Helma Etno. You want to be the last? Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, it's fine, it's fine, no problem. So let me, let me hear then, let's say, um, Carl, can, can, do we have another mic? Let me hear Carlos Martinez from LACNIC's position when it comes to net neutrality and OTTs. Please, Carlos. Thank you, Shernan. Um, this is, this is the really interesting for me to be part of this panel, and um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity of having uh, the chance to comment on the whole net neutrality and OTT debate. Well, let, let me give you my point of view as a long-time internet user and network engineer. I, I, the, the whole discussion has always left me, you know, with my, my, my mouth open, because I, I, I still don't get why this sort of, there's evidently a conflict, but how it's presented as this epic battle between two sides, one good and one evil. Which one is good and which one is evil depends on which one you stand, right? Uh, but no one seems to actual, actually think of the customer, of the consumer. My personal opinion, consumer comes first. Whatever infighting there is within the industry has to never lose sight that the consumer comes first. So actually my, my, the, the presentation of Dr. King, Dr. King actually for me was incredibly good. I mean, it was music to my ears because actually I don't have much to add. Uh, yeah, uh, I worked for a ISP for 16 years and it was impossible to convince our management that, you know, it was still true that voice revenue was still, you know, the sort of cash cow of the company. But it wasn't growing. In fact, it was, you know, going down. Data revenue was small, but it's, it was growing more than 100% per year. How long did it take for data services to overtake voice? Very little, just a few years. However, when you go by, a mobile service from them, every single package that you are offered in, starts with so, such and such minutes of voice calls and so many SMS. 
When was the last time you sent an SMS? Seriously, I mean, the other day I, I, I said to someone, I, I, I will SMS you because I didn't have data roaming here, and it felt like saying to him, I, I will send you a telegram or, <laughs> or a smoke signal. Seriously. <laughs> he had such a retro, you know, taste in my mouth, and I will send you an SMS. Whoa. <laughs> My, my, my fixed line phone, the last, the last time it rang, it was because someone was trying to sell me uh, car insurance or, and the time before that, because someone died. Seriously, I mean, it's, the, the industry is changing and the product that infrastructure providers need to sell now is data. You need to price it accordingly so you can cost your, the, your needed investments in infrastructure. No one, is, no one is denying that the whole over the top, or the, I mean, I hate the term over the top, by the way. I mean, the, the content industry is actually, you know, uh, creating services that are, are taxing on infrastructure. You need to invest more. That is, that is true, all that is true. No one is denying that. The thing is, you need to price your services accordingly. I mean, and that, I mean, and putting up, putting a price on uh, SMS or voice minutes, it's not going to actually uh, work very well. So uh, I, I bought us a local SIM card here at a, from a store on Front Street in Phillipsburg. And uh, it wasn't an official uh, store, it was just one of these smaller tourist shops. And I got asked like three or four times how many uh, local phone minutes I needed, none. I'm only here for six days. I only need three gigs of data. Oh, and we don't have a plan with three gigs of data. Okay. <laughs> so I, I took whatever they could offer me. Uh, it, it works very well, actually. But the thing is, uh, I think this, this is only telling of the, of the current mindset of some operators, right? That needs to change. Because the world is different. It's, it has changed. And, and resisting that change is not going to take us anywhere. Uh, this has a lot of, a lot of implications and uh, it relates also to this morning's presentation by Sherman about the, the sharing economy. There's a whole set of conflicts around that and around the OTT debate that needs to be solved. But if, if I could end with uh, repeating myself, I would say consumer come first. The rest has, I mean, the industry has to come to an equilibrium by itself but not by actually uh, limiting consumer choice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. I would like to proceed with um, Sydney the Weaver first, and then we go to Karen. Well, our take on this is, and when I mean our BTP in general, it's um, we don't really have a, a stance at the moment in terms of it's on paper or etched in stone, but the consensus is basically the same as what um, the speakers has brought forth um, today, and, and especially um, Giovanni King with, with the concerns over the top services and, and um, the Internet of Things. Um, and again, my personal view of this, and we were at a conference in Curacao about a month ago with the Smart Nation conference um, in Curacao, and somebody made something very, um, made a very good point. They said, um, what is a smart nation? What, what, what are we talking about? Um, where are we going with this? And uh, I think Shrana, you said it also the same way as well, is that we're not doing anything different than we were doing yesterday, and we're not going to do anything different than we're going to do tomorrow. It's just we're doing it in a more efficient way. Um, and that's something that um, changes. It's, it's something that is hard to accept sometimes. But, you know, um, the way it's going right now, we have no other choice but to embrace it and work with it. And use it to our best of our abilities, meaning that especially in the Caribbean, um, we have small businesses that can benefit from these, these, um, these services. Um, where as your product could have been sold locally to let's say maybe 10,000 people, now your product can be sold worldwide to 10 million people. You know? And it's just a matter of you um, applying yourself to the technology that, that is available to you and that is available to the rest of the world. And um, like Carlos also says, is that our service providers has to work along with this as well and not resist it because 
of their present and I would hate to say sometimes outdated business models whereby they are just focusing on one aspect of, of, of the technology which has done good for them for the last umpteen years and not understand that, listen, yes, you'll have to incur some types of losses, you have to incur some types of changes that, that you're not accustomed to, but eventually it'll work itself out. Um, it's, it's, you know, and put in very simple, um, and we have seen this evolution throughout, throughout mankind, whereby um, before we were riding horses, and then the automobile came, and there was a whole revolution about that because people lost jobs. Um, the guy, the blacksmith, didn't, wasn't able to make shoes anymore because nobody bought horses. Everybody had a car. But eventually, the blacksmith learned how to make a part, a metal part, for the car. And he's got a new revenue stream, and it keeps going and going from there. So um, it's a matter of embracing. I think we're just scared of being scared you know, I think that's just, just, that's just the basis of it. You know, hopefully in a very coming, in a very near future, we as BTP will actually um, solidify our, our, our thoughts in terms of, you know, what we, um, with regards to over-the-top services and, and, and stuff like that going forward. Um, we already have a small insight in it where our, our cost, uh, quality of service document kind of in, indicates where we want the industry to be at in terms of quality and to serve um, the customers, the clients, a little, a little better, and with a with a fair standard across the board. So I think that's a that's a good start. Um, and then from there we will we will definitely move on. Okay, thank you, Sydney. Um, Karen, please. Yeah, it's really hard to follow sort of all of these great comments. Um, I think it's probably no surprise that the the Internet Society we believe in an open permissionless uh, innovation internet um, that supports um, users being able to go and get the content and services that they want to. Uh, in some ways, the term OTT, you know, when I kind of saw it come up uh, again, uh, you know, recently, I was like, wow, I, I thought this term died 25 years ago, uh, you know, this is such an old sort of, you know, uh, kind of telco concept, because now we really just talk about internet applications and services, right? Um, so, you know, one of the things in this equation, and, you know, and it's true, and I think we need to get at the issues of competitiveness for um, some of the, the companies we're talking about, but a lot of times when people discuss OTTs, they basically talk about um, the provider side, right, and how do providers deal with the erosion of their traditional revenue base. But I think sometimes that, um, that we need to take a broader look at that equation and, again, also look at the consumer side as well and look at the side of sort of the whole economy because we know these Internet services can unlock potential uh, across the economy that traditional telephony um, just can't. Um, so we really need to take a broader look at this, at, at, at the whole um, space. And again, in our view, we, you know, we support an open, permissionless um, innovation internet where, where users are empowered. Now, I think it's true in looking at, uh, in, in, in some of the work that I've also done um, around the world, it's this issue about how do you transition, right? I mean, it is true that for a lot of these companies, the world is changing very quickly. And when you were used to milking your cash cow and now all of a sudden the model has changed, it can be hard to shift. But I would say that there's other things that I think companies in this position need to look at, especially on the data side. Um, for example, how you manage your data costs, right? And we talked a little bit about it yesterday. When it comes to, you know, supporting internet exchange points, going to content providers like Akamai and Google and seeing if you can get local caches and local points of presence that's going to reduce the amount of money you need to spend on expensive international transit. What are kind of the strategies that you can adopt from the digital age to compete in the digital age? Because thinking about old models are not going to help you compete. Another thing, too, is thinking about new opportunities, and I just want to give one example. Um, I was uh, in Aruba in August uh, for a holiday, and I'm a Pokemon Go player. Does anybody else play Pokemon Go? Okay. 
right? All the kids in my neighborhood completely beat the pants off of me um, at the pokey gyms, but I still play. So, um, I, so I got to Aruba, right? And I was looking for Pokemon Go. And on the Aruba Tourism webpage, they have this whole page about where to find Pokestops in Aruba. And guess what? I turned on my mobile data roaming and I was going around with my husband going to the Pokestops, chewing up mobile data and, uh, uh, you know, and uh, roaming data, right? Now, it would be really interesting. I'm wondering how much the mobile data providers in Aruba are making off of tourists that are coming and just can't help themselves because they got to go to a Pokestop in Aruba. I bet a lot. So things like that in terms of saying what are the new uh, what are the new ways to promote local content? What are the new ways to get content closer to users more cheaply? What are the ways to increase local content hosting in a country? And what are the kinds of services and trends that we can really um, capitalize on that are going out there in the market to raise revenues on the data side as well as to lower costs on the data side? Thank you, um, Karen. Helma, please. Yes. Good afternoon. I asked to be the last because I saw a lot of non-profit and I know that it's easy to say everything for free, everything open, you know, it will pay off. I would like to tell you as an operator, we are prepared for the data. But I think that the data, how it grows, is growing exponentially, is catching everybody by surprise. So nobody knew that data would grow so rapidly. So all operators, are really catching up. Additionally, I am completely in favor of everything. I even made notes when Giovanni King was speaking and the other speakers, because I felt all they said was relevant. I agree with it, but there's another reality in the Caribbean. When I hear net neutrality, I'm like, why do we even worry to mention it in the Caribbean? Get yourself connected first. So I feel that governments should not start with net neutrality because as an operator, we have seen that Takes in matter as an example. To put fiber on the ground, you need close to 20 to 30 million dollars. The max you can get in clients is maybe 13,000 best case. So if you want data to be affordable and cheap, someone has to contribute. When our company built a fiber cable for 17 million, we lost on that cable, but we're government owned, so we did it. So I said you have two choices. Either you ask everybody like Telem to contribute like we did, just now, someone also asked me during lunch, help us, we are busy with innovation for kids. I said, fine, but if I contribute and people that use my infrastructure to a point at times that quality of service is even an issue because certain applications I learn, like fiber, are not using the data efficiently. Even when you are offline, it occupies a pipe. So it means that these providers are making money, they don't pay taxes, they don't pay license fees, they don't pay millions to the, to the regulator, and then we have to be sophisticated, and I'm like, why don't we, at least in the Caribbean, ask certain people like the OTT providers and all these big companies to also contribute to the economy, because on our own, alone, with so many, so with a little few inhabitants, the infrastructure and the roads that Giovanni showed you will not be built. And then we focus on net neutrality, and I agree with net neutrality, but restrict it in a sense that Priority, I agree with you, Fanny, you should give priority to certain traffic. If everything is blank, it means that if I am busy and I have a hospital and I have an, I'm busy with e-medicine and it has to have equal priority over someone busy with Pokemon, I don't think you want that. So I would say net neutrality is a topic that is important, but we should not go haywire and make everything equal in a community where the bandwidth is still a resource that is limited. So my focus would be for governments. First, put a priority to connect everybody. Find funding for that before you start to regulate the operator. So when you are an operator, at times you are being penalized. You have to pay millions to a regulator. You get all kinds of rules. And then once you have the infrastructure, the people using it all the time, they go free. So I said, that is discrimination. So I'm also open-minded, allow us take off the regulation, take off all these fees, and then I'm, in, I'm together with WhatsApp, Facebook, and the people of St. Martin will pay for internet maybe $10. So I don't agree, I don't disagree with you about OTT and these modern fashions, but I said, what is important in a small economy 
with only a few inhabitants. To me, first, get the highway, find funding, and then think about net neutrality. And then OTTs are not licensed. They don't pay taxes. Why would we always give them a better treatment than the operators who are building your infrastructure? So if you don't discriminate, and I don't need to pay the regulator, and I don't need, I'm not regulated, then let all of us do and leave the market to work for itself. Competition has proven that it works. And if I don't pay the millions and I'm not constantly going to the weaver to get some licks, then you will see that the market will, so you have to do it both ways. But we feel that with the new rules, we are catering everybody from abroad and locally, we have so many things to abide by and so many fees to pay for. So my point is I'm not against OTTs. I said, let's everybody pay a fair contribution and let's focus first to connect people and give them affordable internet access. And then the discussion about whether it is neutral or not, then that becomes relevant to me. Okay, thank you very much, um, Helma. One last thing, okay. I am also completely in favor of open and uncensored internet, so don't get me wrong. Okay, thank you very much. Thank all of you for your, for your thoughts. Carlos basically focused a lot on the consumer side. So what he has been saying is that basically all the times we are talking about, um, we are focusing on all kinds of things, but we don't focus much on, on consumers. Ma, um, Sethi the Weaver, so, Yes, I had to take my glasses off because, um, um, how do you call it? Myopa, so I don't need glasses to read. So, so um, let me go first to Karen Rose. So Karen focused as well on, let's say, the consumer side. So, um, and she did focus a lot on permissionless innovation. So for her and also, let's say, Internet Society's voice, which um, she is um, representing on this, um, in the pan on this panel, she would like to see that we continue to focus on, let's say, consumers and to maintain that permissionless innovation model. And finally, um, Helma did throw what we call in the Caribbean uh, a bomb, you see? Bomb? Yes. She did throw like a missile, yes. Um, she has been saying that basically we are focusing, we are protecting, we are discriminating against, let's say, the, the local operators because we are focusing a lot on, on foreign organizations and basically we don't give, let's say, the local organizations, let's say, the same treatment. Okay, so basically that is in a nutshell what she has been, been saying. Okay, now, so my question would be for all of you, what, and let me start this time with Helma. Um, what, what does impede, let's say, um, so what, what is the reason, because you have been saying that um, there is like discrimination against, in this particular case, TELAM, if you compare it with other organizations, but have you ever um, think a thought about, let's say, um, collaborating maybe with these great giants and see how maybe you can still offer some new services while they are using your network? And I would like to hear that from the others as well. Okay, what we have done, because we are in for partnerships, and I am in the board of Kanto, the regional telecom organizations, and we have tried to speak to the Facebooks and the WhatsApp, and they don't even worry to have a conversation with us. We thought, as the Caribbean, we are together a big force. So maybe if we can entertain a discussion, we can maybe brainstorm with them how we can both benefit for the use of infrastructure, especially in the Caribbean where with small communities, it is an expensive resource because we don't have millions of subscribers like they do. They don't even have a discussion with us. So we said, why do governments now constantly even promote and favor that they are unlicensed, that there is no rule, and why do, are there rules for me? So I don't mind them. I even like them. I use WhatsApp all the time. So I even enjoy it. So I don't want to take it away from people. But I said it is not fair that the ones that are paying taxes, pay interconnect fees, pay BTP fees, do everything that they have to do as a good citizen, even sponsor stuff, 
that they don't get equal treatment. And then I hear net neutrality, OTTs are a lot. And I'm like, why do they even go? Why do they worry with that? Our concern should be give our citizens first the highway and affordable and leave the market for now to regulate itself. Don't give me extra regulations and leave the others for free. So I feel that that is a discrimination. Okay. I would like to play like a bit devil advocate with you and then we proceed with the other ones. You are focusing on give them that highway, but do you realize that once you give them that highway, they will do all these things that um, basically you are against? I'm not against it. I uh -huh. even like it. Don't get me wrong. Okay. I said to build a highway, there should be some, it should be fair because the contribution to the highway, the fees we ask customers in small communities are not sufficient to build a highway with the data rates that we would like our consumers to have. You don't want the data to become unaffordable. So I said, if you know that, you have two choices. Mm -hmm. Either you ask, you don't give me all these fees to pay and regulations so I can have lower fees, or you ask the Googles and the Facebook and the WhatsApp to at least come to the table to see how they can contribute, mm -hmm. or ask governments like how they have universal service funds to do something to create and build that highway. But don't expect an operator that has all these millions to just sit and say, yes, it's fine, leave all these people come and do all these free things and who's going to build that highway? So my concern is, the cost to build a highway needs to be shared, and I don't mind all these applications. I even love them. But somewhere, somehow, they don't have an obligation, no regulation. Why do I have that okay. while I invest in the, in the community? So I also want to be reg free from regulation. Yes, that okay. is my appeal. Okay, thank you. So I would like to... One of the roles of a regulator is to, let's say, to listen to all its stakeholders, right? So basically, a good regulator should be there doing consultation, listening to what is going on in the, in the, in the, in, in the market. So um, we do have, let me see, two regulators here on, <laughs> on this panel, but I would like to hear from, let's say, others as well. Before I give, let's say, the, the regulators the opportunity to um, elaborate a bit on this, on this um, question, I would like to ask um, Christina as well, as uh, representing, let's say, a multi-billion organization, Google. I think, of course, you have heard all these sometimes um, complaints or challenges with respect to Google. So when it comes to, let's say, investing in the local infrastructure of a given country, we're talking here about St. Martin, for example. So what would be your advice, if you can ask like that, I know you're a lawyer, um, what would be your advice when it comes to um, what could be done to, let's say, helping, in this particular case, small operators? Again, a good regulator should be there, and we should be able to listen to all stakeholders. We have operators, we have governments, we have um, consumers, we have equipment uh, manufacturers, all these are stakeholders within, let's say, the internet ecosystem. So that is why it's very important to listen to them. And I think if we do have a challenge or a problem in a given country, then we should be able to addressing this in the most um, effective way. And this is exactly what I think we should be doing. It's not about replicating what the Europeans have done. It's not about replicating what the Americans have done. We should be able to discuss our own challenges and come down with solutions that are applicable to us. So using that as a point of departure, I would like to um, hear from Google. What do you think um, um, of, of, of this approach? Then I would like to hear that from the others on the panel as well. Maria Thanks. Christine. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah. Um, okay, it's a big question. So I, I will start by saying the following. Um, obviously, Google was born as um, a search engine, and we developed, obviously, uh, content providing solutions. And I think it goes, I mean, I cannot speak for the industry, um, but I, and, and I'm also not a lawyer, sure not, by the way, um, but I think I can speak um, to all the other efforts um, that, that we're doing in the, in the connectivity front. And I understand this might not be readily applicable to St. Martin yet, but we are working on experimental technologies to partner with 
um, the telecom operators, Project Lewin is one example, to really, I mean, we're trying to get sort of to solve the problem that comes uh, from the difficulties from connecting, you know, connecting uh, very difficult populations. I will say that I wholeheartedly agree with Helen when she says that uh, we both um, fight together a little bit or, or you know, in different um, areas for lowering the barriers to investment uh, in broadband networks. I don't think we wholeheartedly agree with that. I think um, that getting getting the highway there, as she mentions, um, is definitely the utmost priority. Um, and I'm sure that for the case of St. Martin, as is for the case of every single jurisdiction across the Caribbean, there are regulatory barriers that we can probably all sit down and discuss that, that would make sense for uh, the users in the end to get the content they're looking for, which is, you know, as some of the other panelists have mentioned, the end goal. I will say one thing, though, about the net neutrality um, sort of idea here. Um, it's not, I, I do think it's a, it's a guiding principle of how the internet was born. Um, and I don't, I don't know that you can put one thing in front of another. What I would say for, you know, from my experience in talking to regulators is that the main question uh, always is who gets to make that decision um, in, you know, in management traffic. I, I don't think that either a Google or a telecom operator should be the one making that decision. It's never been the case um, that, that that's sort of how the internet was born. I think that's why I mentioned case by case basis. That's why I mentioned a backstop from regulators. Uh, I, I think that it, it deserves a whole um, hard this sort of thought process and discussion uh, about what it is that we want uh, the internet to represent for St. Martin users, for Caribbean users. Uh, and I think that they, you know, users deserve the same equal treatment across the world. So uh, if we focus on that, then we, you know, we need to sort of keep that in mind as we, as we follow in the discussion. Um, I think I'll leave it there for now, but if you have more questions, I'm, I'm still here. Okay, thank you, Marini. Maria Cristina. So I would like to hear to Sidney the Weaver as a regulator, your opinion on that? Hello. Yeah, it's, um, it's a tough one. <laughs> tough, not in the sense that it's difficult to answer, but it's tough in terms of the regulator, yes, um, having to pick sides, really. You know, it, it's um, as it stands now, and we had this conversation a little earlier um, with Helma, is that our regulations is not as strenuous as one would think it is. Um, our regulations are based on, on, on certain things that, um, yes, um, it's a bit outdated in terms of what we actually have on paper with regards to the services. Um, I think uh, Giovanni also alluded to it um, earlier today and uh, this afternoon, and you as well, Shannon, whereby um, we came out of an era um, of traditional telecoms when you had circuit switches and stuff like that, where certain rules and regulations had to be put in place. And we kept that true, right through until present day. And um, that is something too internally where we're, we're working on in terms of modernizing that aspect of it um, in, in regards to licensing. Um, with regards to the, the, the fees that are paid, the fees are mostly based on um, spectrum, which is a whole different ballgame altogether. So it's, it's not, I wouldn't exactly say it's fair to put everything in all eggs in one basket and, and then make an argument of it. But yes, and uh, from our side, yes, it has to be modernized, has to be looked at differently in order for um, the ones that we regulate to be able to compete with um, what is coming in terms of you know the technologies and we're talking about over the top services and etc. So it is it is a process and it, it is happening. Um, maybe not as fast enough as as Helma would like it to do, but we we are getting there. Um, another aspect of it is too is as well as is, is um, sharing your network. You know, um, if we see the wider Caribbean, um, basically in in the early days there were maybe if you can split the Caribbean up in three entities, in terms of you have the British Caribbean, or what is known as the former British Caribbean, to a certain extent, then you have the French Caribbean and then the Dutch Caribbean, and then 
in between your some some Spanish speaking countries. But um, all of those that I mentioned before, the three entities, they had their own government owned telecoms uh, companies. So they were the only one on the island that was allowed to to uh, render services. Now, coming out of a monop monopolistic type of um, uh, atmosphere and then going into a um, one of competing with 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 other um, service providers, it it um, it brings challenges, and one of those is is that um, yes, it will cost them much more to to develop a, a, a state of the art um, infrastructure, which is Telemis right now doing along with um, UTS on the island, and um, we as a regulators we have sort of how should I know. Um, start the fire in terms of start the conversations. Listen, um, in different conferences, we have talked about the Singapore model, um, which people tend to get sick of hearing, I guess. Um, and there's other models similar to it. Um, if you take right across the road from us, St. Bart's, the government literally took over um, the infrastructure and, and paid out their, their service providers and they have them um, co-share locations and co-share you know, towers, et cetera, et cetera, because um, you don't want, especially island like that or any island, you don't want to have a bunch of towers all over the place because it's going gonna, it's gonna to look ugly. It's going to devalue your, your, your real estate um, costs and stuff like that, and especially Simbarts. I mean, Simbarts, the attraction of Simbarts is exclusivity. Um, the million-dollar homes are there. I mean, one into the next, you don't want to see a tower grow up in front of your lovely view of the ocean. So the government has taken a considerable effort to say, listen, we want to protect that, that revenue stream. And the way we're doing it is that we're going to, take over the infrastructure, and you guys can do what you're, whatever you're doing now, but this is where you're going to do it, you know? And I think that's one of the smart approaches. Um, um, back in the day as well, uh, Capian in the Netherlands had a similar problem. Um, eventually, they opened up the networks, the network to, to, to third parties, and they're still alive. They still have customers. Um, they're getting other revenue streams by people jumping onto the network and providing services. So these are the things that, again, you have to, um, it's the same game, but, you know, the players are different. Uh, the fields, are, you know, one feels a little better than the other, you know, so, but it's, it's the same game. You just have to modernize and, and, and come up with, with innovative ideas in terms of how do we continue to be um, in it. And um, um, again, if I touch back on Simarting a little bit, you know, right now we have um, Telem is, is investing heavy in fiber to the home, which is a good thing. Um, UTS is, is doing their fiber project as well. Um, GB did their own internal fiber project as well. And then, you know, cable TV did some fiber as well. And, um, but we're yet to see some meshing uh, where that is concerned. Um, I know, if I may say, um, <laughs> LM and, and, and cable TV are, are joining together. So they're, they're, that's meshing on that side, you know, but what about the others? And um, I think that's where your cost is going to come down at some point in time where you have a quote unquote, a neutral um, network and as well, your cost will come down um, and therefore you can, you can carry that on to your customers, you know? So that's, that's, um, uh, that's my, my, my view on that. Okay, so I would like to hear Karen, Giovanni, and also um, Carlos' view on that. Yeah, I think it's a valid point to uh, really uh, talk about capital costs, right, and, and how much, especially given the size of the market here. It is a challenge, and the Caribbean has unique challenges um, that are unlike other parts of the world. Um, as well. Uh, and I know there's a lot of, um, you know, you can take a look at it from a competition side um, as well. And, you know, what, what can governments do to try and lower unnecessary additional capital costs on operators or, or make those things uh, easier, um, especially to promote competition? So sort of dig once policies, you know, putting in potential sort of conduits so any provider can then come and run fiber much easier and Instead of having every operator having to dig up the street and dig up rights of way every time they want to put an in infrastructure. That's, you know, one strategy on, on the competition side as an example. There are, I know, other markets um, in Europe, um, you know, I tend to look at, and there's some studies saying, you know, do what you can to promote comp 
competition, even on the services side, right? Even on the infrastructure side. Um, in Europe, there are some communities going back and looking at sort of community run models, right? So um, uh, government operated mo models at some way for municipalities and larger. Um, it, it, you know, it's an interesting approach, but people are, and, and different regions are looking at this issue of capital costs, especially when we're talking about fiber and very high speed access. Um, in terms of critical services, you mentioned things like hospitals and schools. You know, that's another question of where governments can help provide uh, potential um, subsidies to things like schools, things like hospitals and real critical services. And, you know, many parts of the world, there are universal service funds or, or you know, funds to help schools and hospitals. In the United States, we had E-rate, for example. Um, that did come off a tax on people's phone bills to be able to provide that service. But there's a number of different models at looking at how do you get um, things for telehealth, telemedicine to places that, that need it uh, potentially at subsidized cost. So um, that's another um, potential approach. Overall, however, I would really caution against trying to um, put taxes or measures really on the content side. Uh, one of the things that we have found in studies about access is that for now, for many people around the world, it's not the cost of access that's preventing people from going online. It's more that people say, well, I don't know if there's really anything for me on the internet right? Local language content is a barrier. Cult local culturally appropriate content is a barrier. So what we're starting to see now is a shift, again, in people not saying that it's too expensive, but I don't know if there's anything on it for me. And the more that we look at sort of taxing content, throttling content, etc., that gets us further into a hole of providing incentives for people to get online in the first place. So I do absolutely take the point of looking at the issues of capital costs and infrastructure investment. My recommendation would be to make sure to decouple that from looking at taxes on or uh, other preventative measures on content. Giovanni, please. Um, once again, I would like to agree with what has been said. Um, already. I think that, as Shonen indicated, regulators need to listen. And I think this is a problem that we need to address together. We in the Caribbean, most of the times, most of us live on small islands or we have small economies of scale. And that's why, for that reason, um, why we, as a regulator in Curacao, are proposing to consider and we did the initial discussions with the operators locally where we are saying, listen, everybody is making or everybody is seeing that they have a lot, of, or a lot of money. They have money, funds to invest, to build that ultimate fiber network that everybody wants. But if everybody builds it, and in the case of Curacao, well, we went from three fixed line operators to two because Digicel um, acquired Tris which is one of the local um, um, fiber operators um, on the island. But that would still mean that there are two, no, still, yeah, three still actually with Digicel, people, organizations trying to build that, that infrastructure that would reach each and every one of us. Because within our um, legal framework and the concessions, um, granted to everybody, it, it states that you need to have island-wide connectivity. As the regulator, we're saying, well, it's not a workable um, proposition. We need to think about new ways to give that access. And our position is one infrastructure with rules and regulations, how to regulate connectivity and how to provide access um, on a neutral, non-discriminatory basis. What we want to do there as well is say, let's sit down and look at how you charge for what each and every consumer is, is using over, your, over that infrastructure so that we're, we make sure that we that want to make use of each and every service pay for that what we consume. We don't think that there is an all-you-can-eat concept 
because that would mean that those of us that use less pay so that I could use more. Let's look at those models. Let's really sit down and discuss those. Let's see how, and I've been informed that it has been discussed here in, on the previous days. Let's sit together and see how we maximize the usage of our internet exchange exchanges. Let's start to peer with each other. Let's keep local traffic local instead of me sending an email to my neighbor and it needs to go out the way to Miami before it hits my neighbor because we don't trust each other. What do we need to do to trust? And I'm not talking operators amongst each other, but operators vis-a-vis -vis the regulator. Um, how do we work on that trust level for us to really be able to sit down and discuss the subject matter without somebody thinking, well, if I put my information on the table with a regulator, it'll end up with, by the competitor. We're trying to create an ecosystem where everybody makes money, hopefully, but where the consumer is able to use new technologies and services in a way that has been set here in the panel as well. Create that innovative environment, create the option and the opportunity for us as Caribbean nationals, if you want to consider it like that for a moment, to bring our products to the rest of the world. I mean, we are consumers of everything and we are not using current technology or the possibility that technology gives us to start and sell what is unique to us. Sun, sand, and sea, there's only so much we can get out of it. We need to use technology to move forward. If we don't sit down and try to address these issues together, five years from now, in Curacao, we'll have hopefully three networks, maybe not all of them would be profitable. In St. Martin, we'll have more, maybe not all of them would be profitable, and we would still be discussing the same issue. Somewhere somebody needs to say, go to Great Bay, Sonesta, and don't come out of that conference area until you guys tell us how are we going to build that one infrastructure with competition on service level where we charge everybody what is needed? And I'm, again, taking one model that should be working when you look at energy, electricity, generation. The per kilowatt hour fee that I pay is not the same as Sonesta pays. The kilowatt hour fee that I pay is not the same that maybe the local operators pay. These are models that exist and apparently work. Why do we need or why do we think in our industry that I like so much that need, we need to do it differently? I don't think it doesn't work like that. If I use more, I'm supposed to pay more and I'm the consumer and I'm looking at it from that perspective, but don't try to stop innovation and, and development just by us to say, well, this costs money. I have sat in a meeting with banks in Curacao while we discussed the one infrastructure um, proposition and the banks indicated that if there is that one infrastructure, that fiber infrastructure that would last for, what, 15, 20 years if we follow um, current technology, they will all be glad to invest. But if we build three different infrastructures and the numbers don't match up for them to get that return on their investment, guess what? They will not invest. We need to sit down as grown up people and address the issue. Thank you, Giovanni. Basically, you did give some recommendation. I was going to ask recommendation at the end, but okay, it's fine. So let me hear Carlos' opinion because I still would like to open the floor for two or three questions and then we will be um, finishing this session. It's, um, we don't have enough time, I mean, if you like to do, to do justice to this um, session, but at least I would like, we would have loved to um, touch base on some um, issues. So, Carlos, go um, So, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, I, I would like to 
particularly highlight something that Karen said and something that Giovanni said. I'm going to start with something that Giovanni said. Uh, I mean, power companies have been charging users for what they consume for over a century. I, I still don't get what is keeping ISPs from going into that model. Imagine, imagine a world where actually power companies would have kept charging everybody the same fee and tried to play a tax on the manufacturer of the light bulbs. How do you think that market would have evolved? That's one thing. Uh, the other is, let me ask, ask you something. Are there any OTTs from the Caribbean? I would say that there are some. I mean, in my opinion, every content is OTT. It's basically something that uses the network. Perhaps there are no more, uh, I would say, sophisticated OTTs from the Caribbean. But however, the potential for them to exist is there. If you look at the whole debate about if you should tax or regulate or, some, or somehow license the OTTs, look at it for a moment, turning things around. What, what would happen if you go to that model and then someone from San Martin comes with the idea, for example, let's create a voice over IP application for Caribbean immigrants into the US. How big a chance do you think that application would have of actually being allowed to operate in the US if you go to the licensing model, zero. You could have killed the potential for Caribbean OTTs to exist. That's one thing. So when I hear all these debates about the licensing, potential licensing of OTTs, my comment is be careful what you ask for, seriously. Be careful what you ask for because you may get it, okay? And at some point you may regret that. The other thing is, and going back to my, my past as an airway engineer and an ASP, let me tell you something. I'm not from the uh, Europe. I'm not from the US. My experience come for, comes from a very small country. My uh, previous employer, the ISP, had 1 million um, broadband uh, connections, which I, I understand is a lot larger than many of the economies in the Caribbean. However, we had another disadvantage that you don't have. Every fiber that we lay is over 10,000 kilometers long, each one of them. Compare that with, with the length of fiber you have to lay to get to Miami. It's probably a fraction of that, right? Well, I will say if you take the, the, the overall numbers, we are in a pretty similar position. So I think some, some of my experience is applicable in this case. So when you try to engage the OTTs in conversation, there is one thing that's usually overlooked, which is what kind of conversation is that? Is either you OTT, please pay us, or you OTT, how can you help us resolve this problem? So what my company did at some point in time, uh, I don't think they, are, they were particularly wise or anything. I mean, probably they were lucky or they had the right people at the right time. Uh, the conversation they had was, how can we bring content closer to our customers and in turn save on transit costs, save on that pipes that are over 10,000 kilometer longs, and let me tell you something, they are really expensive, really expensive. And each thousand kilometers you add to a submarine cable increases the cost a lot. Okay, so for, our, for us, bandwidth is a premium, delay is at a premium, so it makes a lot of sense to get, to get our uh, content closer to us and to have a sensible policy for local traffic exchange, which is something that Karen mentioned. I'm, I'm surprised about how few large ISPs have sensible local interconnection policies and have a, someone, for example, in charge of getting new peering agreements. Seriously, in this time and age, you should probably have a whole division of people working on getting new peering agreements because that's how you save on transit costs. A peering agreement different from a transit cost. A peering agreement is basically an agreement between peers where you agree to exchange traffic, but no one pays for the traffic. The only cost to cover is the cost of infrastructure. It's what an IXP does, for example. So I have some numbers to share with you. You can save up to 50% of your transit traffic is if you do proper peering. Why? Because all the big sources of traffic are there for, to be locally cached. That is Netflix, that is Google, 
that is everything under the Yahoo brand, which are a lot of things, also under Google, other things as well, things that are not as familiar to you, but the, something called the CDNs, Content Distribution Networks, for example, Akamai, for example, Cloudflare, they are willing to put infrastructure inside your network so they also get to have their content closer to your eyeballs, okay? So that is the conversation you need to engage the OTT in. So there is something to be said about that conversation as well. That conversation is not usually that easy either. Why? Because some of them have strict policies about how much traffic your network has to generate in order for them to justify bringing a cache. If I remember correctly, for example, Google will ask you for a one gigabit sustained traffic in order to bring a cache to your network. But that's a completely different conversation to have. Google, can you please be a little more flexible in your caching policy versus Google, please pay us money. That's a very, very, very diff different conversation. One has a chance of succeeding, the other doesn't. Um, that is basically my take on all of this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Carlos. I still would like to open the floor for one question. One question. Okay, let's make it two then. Short questions. Yes, as regulators and also as Internet Society, you're discussing the openness and uh, basically the freeness of the Internet. However, a lot of content providers are already basically closing the door, especially on the Caribbean. Sometimes you go on YouTube, you'll see not available in your country. You go to the Play Store, this app, not in your country. So a lot of people have to resort to VPNs. So have, has that power already not been taken away from you guys? Are you addressing that question to a particular mm, reason of? No, in general, actually, the, the internet society, the regulators, uh, the industry, basically. So it's up to you guys who would like to answer it. Short answer, please. Yeah, um, some of this has to do with more of intellectual property um, issues. Um, from the internet society perspective, you know, we think that that information and content should be sort of as, as open and accessible as possible. Um, I want to get it to the word, um, uh, some people talk about an open and free internet, thinking that it's completely sort of cost free. Um, I think that's not sort of the right mindset um, to uh, think about it, but in terms of an open internet. Um, but again, in terms of um, intellectual uh, property, Policy. I mean, I think that's one of the areas to look at, and there needs to be continued um, uh, show of demand of content from regions like the Caribbean and others to continue to entice uh, more activity and to get more um, content and information down in this region. Um, and I would just really like to um, uh, sort of comment on um, your uh, comments regarding the things about, you know, again, sort of pops and caches and about that being an effective way to um, help reduce costs on network and to help get more content here a lot more quickly and a lot more cheaply. It's a real key to sort of managing this cost equation. Okay, last, you're in the, okay, last question please. Good afternoon, uh, Malcolm Jack, UTS. I have a question particularly for Sydney the Weaver. Uh, we talk about the, for example, the, our infrastructure network, fiber optic particularly. Is there ever a time where the Bureau of Telecommunication thought of probably just speeding up that process of having just one major infrastructure company and entertain the idea of the Bureau quantifying that what we already have on the ground, purchase the infrastructure from the telecommunication company, and being, being a player that is both on the consumer side, the provider side, and the government doing the regulation, purchase the inf infrastructure, probably got, get the financing from an external source, and purchase it. 
And these very same monies that the company are spending, it will go into providing better service and reliable service to the consumer. Have that ever been entertained by the Bureau? <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a good question. Um, I'll answer it in two ways. I'll answer the short one first. Um, as a regulator, oh, oh, only please only the short one. Yes. Because the short one we run we run all the time. No. Um, I'll I still have to do it in two ways because number one, um, how far do you want the regulator in your business? As it is now, you're already kind of balling about it, you know. So that's the short answer uh, on that part of it. Um, with regards to having a neutral body, yes, of course, we had conversations on um, separately, and I just I mentioned it earlier, and uh, I think Giovanni alluded it, um, to it as well, and the other panelists um, um, as well, is that um, this is something that has to come, the, the, the parties involved has to talk to each other. You know, we can only do so much with regards to that. Yes, we can, we can set a sort of a framework in terms of, listen, this is how, if you guys come together with your, with what is already in the ground and you share it, right? And this is the framework in terms of this is how fair access can be, can be given. That framework, yes, we can provide that coming from a neutral standpoint because we don't have no invested interest in it other than make sure that the clients get the best out of it and other startups as well. Um, that we can do. But to say that to get into the business of infrastructure and stuff like that, do you really want that? You know, um, like Carl's already alluded, be careful what you ask for because at the end of the day, you know, um, you, you will be, first thing he says, well, you know, the regulator is holding me back or this is holding me back. No, we want to, we live, I mean, you guys, like Giovanni already alluded, you guys are adults, you know, uh, come to the table and, and face the reality of things. And then there's some compromise will have to be made. Some, some might lose, some might win. Um, but we can provide a framework for fair competition once that, once that entity is formed. Of course, we, we, we'll be more than glad to assist. Actually, we were trying to push that from, from day one. Okay, Helma Joseph, very short um, comment. Just to addition, when I saw how, where the conversation is going, you see how much emphasis is placed on infrastructure. And while sitting here, I said, if they push too many regulations, maybe I should become an OTT, and then St. Martin will be left without someone to provide infrastructure. So we should be careful that not with modern ideas and without incentives to the operators, that you push them to become an easily unregulated OTT and there is nobody to be found for the infra cost. So that was, that's in essence my message. I also thought of liberalization. In the past, we said in the Caribbean, let's open up everything. And I see a trend now where only giants are buying up all the companies. So shortly, you will have duopoly. So the same with OTT and everything. I welcome them. I like them. But we have to be careful if no incentives are given to the operators, they will also jump and go to the OTT side, and maybe nobody will be there to build an infrastructure. So that was, in essence, okay. My so, answer. so basically, I would like to, I, I will, I, I will give all of you ten seconds to say some final thoughts. Ten seconds. But first of all, I would like to thank, let's say, Maria Cristina, because why I'm mentioning Maria Cristina? She's not here, but Maria Cristina has been very active, especially in the Caribbean. It's a pity that she didn't make it this time to, to the Caribbean. But most of the time, sometimes you talk about Google and other big organizations. But this particular lady, she has been around coming to, let's say, our events in, in, in the wider Caribbean and trying to give, let's say, their contribution to the development of the region as well. So that's why I would like to just highlight that for us to think a bit um, on that because it's not always that you think, okay, Google and other big organizations, they're just trying to get money out of us, of, of those kind of things. So with that, I would like to give each one of you 10 seconds to say some final thoughts. I would like to start first with Maria Cristina and then we will um, bring this session to a closing. Maria. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I don't claim to be to be an expert at all. I, I keep learning from all of you about the challenges in the Caribbean. Uh, they're very different from from other places that I work on. Um, I, I will just say I think this panel has been wonderful in highlighting the different options and 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 important things that we need to think going forward. 
I agree with Karen when she mentions digital skills and local content as being, you know, the center of our attention and that's where we're heading now. Um, I also think that going and making things easier for connectivity is what we're all about. So in the Caribbean, we're actually um, working with different governments on caching for IXPs. And I, I do agree that that's uh, an area of opportunity going forward. Um, and I will just leave it at, um, at thanking you for opening up this debate. It's not pivoting one thing over another, but really thinking through what the actual um, challenges are in smaller regions and in smaller countries like the ones in the Caribbean. So thank you very much. Thank you. Helma, please. Okay. Again, I would say we are a Telam group completely in for the open and uncensored internet, but we feel that the focus should be to ease the regulation on the operators and to also shift the discussion from neutrality or not to really first connect the people and give them affordable internet access. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Helma. Sidney? Um, yes, um, again, I would like to, and I said it throughout um, this week as well in the different forums that I uh, was a panel of, that I would like to see at the end of the day that um, the Caribbean become, with its, with its 40 plus million inhabitants, become the silicone beach of this part of the world, um, creating our own content for our own people, um, and by extension, the rest of the world as well, as well who, who wants to, to partake in it. And I think that's the only way that we can actually, um, one, lower the costs, um, two, uh, provide the necessary services for ourselves, um, and, and again, by reverting to that lower cost as well. Um, and we have to really make a concerted effort to, to move towards that direction, you know, and together as, as one Caribbean um, going, going forward. Thank you. Karen? Yeah, I think the, the market is changing and it's always really useful to continue to look at, at regulation and what needs to be sort of changed to move the market forward. Um, the issue of investment in infrastructure, I think, is unique in the Caribbean region and this region does have challenges. And I think a multi-stakeholder approach of looking at these challenges and trying to think creatively about how ensuring the region gets the best infrastructure possible is a completely um, legitimate debate that needs to be had in order to move these uh, all of our economies forward. Um, at the same time, I think we need to make sure that we we don't uh, make uh, specific decisions that come at the expense of an open internet, an internet that's open for innovation, and an internet that's open for people to create the services that are going to move forward the knowledge economy. I think that this issue about sun, sand, and beach only going so far is really true. So we need to take a holistic view of the issues and the challenges, and we have to make sure that we don't put unnecessary uh, regulations or throttling on basically the, the goose that's laying the gold neck. Dr. King. <laughs> thank you very much for the title. Um, and thank you for inviting me um, to speak and having me participate in this dialogue. I think dialogue is the only um, solution for us to address this um, issue. I think open, uncensored, and yeah, dialogue is, is what will help us find that middle ground and find a solution for each of our islands, um, considering that we are unique and that we need to address our unique um, problems and challenges based on local knowledge. And that is the only way for us to do it. Operators, regulators, um, um, politicians, um, because, you know, when, the, when you play with their votes, um, you know, they, they take strange they make strange decisions we need to all come to the table and have this discussion and that's the way forward thank you giovanni carlos when you buy a cell phone in a, from several operators in argentina you get an application that actually remotes your phone line over voice or ip anywhere in the world how cool is that that's an ott that's a local ott you could be ashamed to see those kinds of applications from our region killed under a spider web of, of cross regulations and cross reciprocal licensing agreements. The enabling environment for us to create cool applications that serve our region and our communities is there. Please do take advantage of that enabling environment. Do not kill it. Take advantage of it. 
make money out of it. As Dr. Green said, you know, how many days a, a year can you go to the beach? But knowledge economy is there. The enabling environment is there. Take advantage of it. Thank you. Okay, let's show them our appreciation. Thank you all.